Hello everybody, again, next another Wednesday, another tutorial. Now, we've pivoted in our class, we've sort of run the gamut of our GIS uh, uh, portion of the course, and we're going to start now on the imagery analysis part of the course. And we're going to start relatively simply with basic uh, image manipulation methods, uh, and a little bit of qualitative pattern analysis. And we're going to use this fantastic free and open source piece of software called GIMP, the GNU Image Manipulation Program. It, uh, like I said, is free and open source. It runs on every platform, Mac, Windows, Linux. So just go to your browser now, download it, www.gimp.org. Click the download button and then essentially find your operating system, click and download. Uh, also, if you go to the course Blackboard site and you go to Project 4, you will find a link to download a TIFF image file that is actually a quick bird satellite image, a high resolution satellite image, very similar to what's used in Google Earth. This is uh, from one of my project areas in northern Jordan, Wadi Kuseba. So once you have GIMP installed, just follow the instructions. What you're going to do is uh, either you can either open up GIMP and then open the file from there, or I just right click on my file and uh, open with GIMP image editor here. So GIMP will uh, load up. It doesn't particularly matter what version you have. 2.8 is what I have, in case you want to make it uh, look pretty much the same. And there we go. We have our image in here. You can see it's a satellite image of a, a, a region in Jordan. There's no GIS capabilities, so we have no idea at this moment exactly what the scale is. I'll just tell you uh, off the top of my head, this is about 10 kilometers, maybe a little less, something like that, from one side to the other. And uh, if we zoom in, which we can do in a variety of ways, there's a, actually a zoom tool over here. And you can just drag a box like that. You can see we get to some point, we get some pixels. Um, if I hold the control button down, my little, if you just see the little icon in the middle of the image there, the plus sign turns to a minus sign. And then when I draw the box, I zoom out. I can also use this, just use the scroll wheel on my mouse. Uh, pressing the control button and scrolling with the scroll wheel on my mouse will zoom in and out like that. Otherwise, it zooms me up and down, or sorry, scrolls me up and down when I'm zoomed in. If I hold the shift button down, I can actually go from left to right by moving my scroll wheel. So all I'm doing there is holding down shift or control uh, and moving the scroll wheel on my mouse. So control to zoom in and out, or I can use the zoom tool over here and shift to go back and forth and just the scroll wheel on, on its own to go up and down. You can also move around by grabbing these things over here. Uh, so I'm going to actually just zoom back out till we see the whole thing. So basically we got this satellite image uh, and this is going to be what we work with just for the time being in GIMP uh, to do some basic enhancements and manipulation so that we can see some of the features in here. Now this is an area that I've done extensive pedestrian field survey and excavation of archaeological sites. Uh, for example, there is a site uh, right here that I excavated. There is a site uh, right here that I excavated. And there is a site, let's see, somewhere up in here that I excavated. Actually, right here that I excavated. Uh, and numerous other archaeological sites and features that I've recorded and all in this area. So this is a real landscape. I really did survey. I really did use this satellite image imagery to help plan uh, some of those surveys and to make nice images afterwards that we used in publications and that we're still using in our analysis. Um, so just a couple of things about the uh, layout of GIMP and how to get around. We got the sort of how to scroll about in the in the software over here we have a tool panel over here we have a layer dialog we have in my case i have some brushes and some other stuff over here uh, you may when you start it off find out that it's in single window mode meaning the image is sort of floating in the background and these docks are sort of floating around above it uh, you may like that personally i like to have it all kind of together so i just go to windows and i click this single window mode and it brings it all together 
just keeps everything a little bit more organized for me. Um, the first thing, if you're familiar with some other software uh, for dealing with photographs, you may find familiar the layout, uh, all of these tools and all this stuff. This looks a lot like Photoshop, uh, especially Photoshop of several years ago. Um, and really this is sort of, you can imagine this is kind of like an open source competitor, or, or not competitor, just an open source alternative, let's say, to some commercial software like Photoshop. So you've got a bunch of things over here, a lot of pixel editing, what they call um, things uh, that you can do to paint, for example, you know, with paint brushes and airbrush, you know, I can paint lines and stuff all over my imagery. We don't want to do that. I'm hitting control Z to undo that. Uh, we don't want to do any of that kind of stuff. For now, that might be fun for making figures, might be fun for editing your photographs. A lot of these tools here are sort of mostly for those things, a little bit more artistic endeavors. But the cool thing about GIMP uh, and even Photoshop is that a lot of the tools that are really useful for uh, manipulating photographs just to make them more pleasing are also useful for doing scientific imagery analysis. And that's basically what we're going to do here. We're going to get an overview of how to do some real basic analyses to enhance the features. Um, I like to call these qualitative enhancements. We're sort of doing this uh, using our intuition and our eye as our guide. If we wanted to do more quantitative analysis, we'd have to use uh, a piece of software that has some of that stuff a little bit more accessible. That's where image J would be sort of maybe my first choice for doing quantitative imagery analysis. But there's definitely a, a, a gray area between the two and the techniques that we're going to learn in GIMP are the same basic techniques we would use to start a qu more quantitative style imagery analysis in something like image J. So the first thing that we're going to do once we have this up and you know I encourage you to explore what some of these other things do. Um, what we're going to do is just find some basic information about our image. So we're going to go to the image uh, file menu up here at the top. We're just going to go down to image properties. This is going to bring up just a little uh, new window here. Uh, let me see if I can grab it properly. Uh, with some information. It tells us the uh, size in pixels of the X and Y direction. In this case we have 9,526 uh, in the X and 4,664 in the Y. So this is a, uh, a really big image. Uh, uh, HD image is um, you know your 1080p or whatever is 1080 in the Y and oh geez 2000 something in the in the X right and uh, what this means is that this image is a lot <laughs> higher resolution than an HD you know image right here. Um, it tells us the print size and image in, of, the, of this particular image. This is sort of a little bit irrelevant, but it has to do a little bit with the resolution. In this case, it's 72 um, pixels per inch. Um, essentially, that if we were to print out this thing, we want to print it at 132 uh, inches by 64 inches. We can change that kind of stuff if we do want to print that stuff up. For our particular analysis, that's what's not important. It's actually the number of pixels, what's important for us. Um, also the color space, RGB color, that's red, green, uh, blue color space. File size, size that it actually occupies in your memory, so you don't want to run out of RAM over here. And the actual total number of pixels that are represented in the image over here. Uh, number of layers, number of channels, number of paths, that kind of stuff. Not particularly important this moment. Uh, but it's just great to have some of this basic information here to get started. So what we know now about this imagery is it's uh, red, green, and blue, meaning it's a full visible color spectrum satellite image. And that can uh, influence the kind of things that we will do. Although we'll see there's some overlap whether we analyze this as uh, color bands or if we analyze this as uh, grayscale. And really the kind of things I'm going to show you right now uh, really they're sort of geared towards single band or, or pan chromatic imagery, but it doesn't matter if we use a color image in this particular instance to start with, okay? Um, so that's basically what we did here in the image thing. We did image properties. Um, there are a couple of other things that we can do in here. Uh, for example, we can rotate 90 degrees, 180 degrees. We can flip the image like a mirror image. Um, we can actually s manipulate the print size and the print resolution uh, over here as well. And uh, well, we can crop automatically if there was white space. Um, we can uh, 
scale the image and this is actually doing an interpolation with uh, a method remember we've seen these before linear cubic Lanxos uh, style so if we wanted to increase the numbers of pixels in the image we could do that through here of course that's not putting new information in that's just interpolating things to a finer degree uh, estimating what a finer resolution might look like uh, these are things that we can use if we want to enhance the resolution in a certain area. So for example, if uh, we zoom all the way in and we get kind of to the point where we're seeing pixels, we can make that smoother. It's not going to bring in new data, but we could certainly do that with this uh, scale uh, method over here. Um, the other thing that we can do is change the color mode. So natively, this is an RGB image. But we may want to convert it to uh, black and white. The very simplest way to do this is simply to push grayscale there, and all of a sudden you see the image is actually now rendered as a panchromatic image. What this has done is taken the, all the luminance values for your red, your green, and your blue, and averaged them at each pixel. So you get an average luminance value uh, in, in grayscale. This hasn't changed the bit depth necessarily. Uh, so if we had, uh, an 8-bit image, this is still going to be an 8-bit black and white image, 0 to 255. If it was a higher bit depth image, like 16-bit, uh, you would have uh, still the 0 to whatever it is, 1026 images, uh, sorry, gray values between this. Uh, but what it has done is condensed the, the color band. So instead of having three separate bands of color, we now just have one band of luminance at the visible wavelengths between um, uh, blue and red. Um, so we, we're going to get back to uh, that before I'm going to hit Control Z to undo. I could also go to Edit Undo over here. Uh, Control Z is a keyboard shortcut that's going to save you time. Uh, we're going to do, be doing a lot of Control Z undoing, right, uh, when we mess around with our image here. Um, so that's the imagery tool over there. Um, the other really neat, neat set of uh, uh, tools are here under the color control panel that we get back. We're going to deal with some of these things here too. Uh, we have some useful tools under the, the tools menu. Um, we could set up things. We could actually measure distances and angles if we calibrated some of that stuff. Uh, and then the other, th the other little menu that we're going to use a lot is the filters menu. We're going to use this actually quite a bit. Uh, to do some of our basic image manipulations. We're going to start with some basic color uh, manipulations. Uh, we're going to start with something called a, a histogram stretch or con uh, 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 color contrast enhancement. Uh, and what we're going to do for that is to go under the color menu here. And we're going to start with this simpler tool called levels. Okay, so we're going to pull this tool up, it's going to pop up in a little dialog right here, and it's going to show us what's called the histogram of the image. And these, in this case, these are luminance values, um, and the taller the peak here, the more frequent that particular luminance value. This is from 0 to 255 levels of gray. So here we have uh, our image. Basically, we're seeing that it's got a peak somewhere here, a little bit to the white side of the middle gray. Right? So the peak is actually moved to the right. The histogram is stacked a little bit to the right. It's not stacked way over here to the right, although we do have some peaks over here in really white values. That's all of our white limestone that we see here. Um, the average values are somewhere between middle gray and a little bit past towards the white side of middle gray. We actually have uh, a really um, uh, uh, minimal amount of pure blacks. In fact, we almost have no pure blacks. We have just a few patches of darks over here. Um, so this particular histogram is just telling us what the spread of the colors or the luminous values are over here in our image. And that's perfectly fine. That's great information to have. But we may want to actually manipulate this uh, profile here to make the, the difference between the blacks that actually do exist and the whites that actually do exist to be smaller. So we want to actually stretch this histogram so we get our blacks all the way to the realm of zero over here and our whites all the way over here to 255 and our, and our mids actually more closely aligned to the actual mids. And that's going to just give us more uh, varieties of colors to deal with. So what we're going to do is kind of create a mapping between this initial histogram and the one that we want. And it's real simple. You see these little uh, arrows that are pointing up at certain places. All we're going to do is 
drag those over to where we want them to be. So if we want our pure black to be here, I've dragged my pure black arrow over and you can see now our image actually looks darker. We've actually increased the frequency of dark tones. If I want to bring my pure whites down, if I know this mess over here is all of these white limestones and they're all blown out basically, what I can do is drag my white point down a little bit like this and now we're actually spreading out our whites that used to be over here all the way to the end of the histogram over here. And we can also do the same thing with our midpoint. We can move our midpoint just a little bit. And that just sort of shapes this, the shape of the curve. And now if I click OK, uh, what we can see is that the colors are actually popping out at us more. And if we zoom in, we see a little bit more detail in some of the colored features between the darks and the, uh, and, and the whites. So this is, like I said, it's called contrast stretching. So if I hit undo, that's what it looked like before. And if I hit uh, redo, control Y, let's just make sure I hit the right button. Where's my Y? Uh, control Y there. That's what we ended up when we did our contrast stretch. So before, it looked kind of washed out. And afterwards, we did our contrast stretch like that. Um, and I just want to point out, if we go back to our tool, our levels tool, that there's a variety of ways that we can mess with this. We can change this thing directly over here, and then we can also change th this sort of bottom outputs over here. And this sort of works sort of opposite. So if I move the white one, it's actually adjusting the black levels. If I move this black one, I'm adjusting the white levels over here. So I can basically cancel out what I did over here. So my advice to you is just to stick with this one over here. Uh, and then play around with it. How far do I have to stretch? How can I move my white, uh, my midpoint around to reduce the severity of the stretch over here? And it's certainly possible to overdo it. For example, if I moved my, my cutoffs really far up, then I'm going to get a really dark edge with too many blacks, right? And vice versa, if I moved my white point too far down, we're going to have too many whites and it's going to look really washed out. So. Uh, you may want to do that to enhance just the sort of dark end of the spectrum. Uh, change where your midpoint is to really just wash out all anything that's sort of light colored and only show the darks. Uh, or you can do vice versa. You can wash out all the all the, the, the white parts and show me just the darks. So I'm going to reset my contrast so just so you can see what a nice uh, sort of mild effect looked like there. Right. So before and after. All right, so is that the only way that we can do a contrast stretch in, in GIMP? Absolutely not. There's a, a couple other tools that we could use to do this. My favorite other tool to do this is actually the curves tool here. Now this is going to look a little strange at first. We got our same contour over here, our same histogram, sorry, over here. And right now we're just looking at luminance values again, and we have a mapping. Okay, so we have our current luminance values, the actual histogram here and we have our desired luminance values over here and we have a line that goes from the bottom left to the upper right so our whites are on this side and our darks are on this side essentially what we're going to do what we could do is find a point here so this particular black and this particular black now are the same and if I grab my line I'm just grabbing with my mouse clicking and keeping the mouse pulled while I'm dragging and I pull this down what I'm doing is changing the mapping so that now this sort of uh, uh, less dark black color is mapped to a more dark black cover over here, color over here. I can do the same thing over here with my whites. I can go up to this point right here. I can click and drag it up so that my uh, uh, sort of less white color over here is mapped to a more white color over here. This is doing exactly the same thing we were doing before. We're dragging our, our white points around and we can drag our middle point too by sort of pulling it over here pulling the curve a little bit below the line to make it a little darker or potentially um, pulling it above the line to make it a little lighter, right? So that's uh, essentially doing the same thing. Um, and if I just reset it like that. Uh, and the really cool thing is we can, we can um, actually do this in this particular tool, not just to the total luminance, but we can do it with each of the individual colors, right, that we're seeing here. So I can actually map uh, reds, I can make my whites more red if I wanted to. I can make my blacks more red too, or less red. 
actually more red by pulling them up like this and I can make my whites less red like that. So I can actually manipulate the um, color frequencies, I guess, uh, at, at each pixel individually. So I can do my reds like this, I can switch over to my greens, and I can really enhance the greens in the light pixels and uh, de-emphasize them, let's say, in the, in the dark pixels. And then I can go now to my blue, and I can just pull blues completely out of the picture. Whoops. Pull blues completely down so that they're out of the picture completely like that. And now I'm sort of looking at just red and greens that were uh, captured by the sensor like we talked about in class the other day. Um, I can also pull the blues down just a little bit. Uh, so these sort of color band manipulations are something we're going to get to a little bit more later on when we deal with true uh, multiband satellite imagery, things that go into the infrared and we'll deal with those kind of manipulations later on, but you can actually do that here in GIMP. So I can just reset the blue channel, I can go back to my green channel, I can reset all these things so you can see what I can do. Now I'm going back right to the straight line, and I can go back to value, which is the luminance, and I can do, you know, I can go back to my normal histogram stretch kind of thing on that. So the color curves are really useful um, sort of slightly more powerful way to adjust the histogram and we can do it by channel and by value as well. So we'll click OK with that. We have our nice contrast stretch. Everything looks a little nicer over here. And now we can start to do um, some other manipulations, some feature extraction kind of manipulation. So the first thing we're going to do uh, for that is um, a threshold. Okay, so we have this tool over here, so again in the color uh, menu here called Threshold. And what this is doing is taking, again, our luminance values, our same um, uh, histogram over here, and, and just setting a hard break. So that anything on one side of the break is going to be coded black, and anything on the other side of the break is going to be coded white. And in fact, we kind of have a, a moving window so that anything actually between this point and this point will be black and anything on that side or the other side will be white. So you can see how that kind of changes as I um, move that around. Actually that's not quite true what I'm saying to you. Um, that's if we just do it like that. See everything in the middle is actually white and if we move it over like that anything to the left over here is black and everything up here is white and then everything on the right of this will be black as well so it's kind of like this part in the middle will be white and everything on either side will be black so I misspoke what I told you before I just want to clarify that so anything within this blue zone here is going to be coated white anything to either side will be black so the easiest way to do a threshold is to leave your white point uh, set to one side and just to move your black point up into the middle like this, right? You see how I'm doing that? And actually what you'll notice is as I move this thing, different features over here are going to pop out. So the dark soils, um, if I, um, sorry, I'll move the slider back over here like this. The dark soils in the uh, sort of moistly irrigated fields are still staying dark because they're dark colors. A lot of the other things are being washed out, turned completely white. So now the image that we're going to make from this will be actually completely binary, completely black or white, either one or zero, right? Uh, and so you can play around with this threshold. And this is really a useful thing to do to accentuate certain features that are either pure white or really white or really black. So if I move my black point all the way to the left, we'd get a pure white image. Now I can move my white point down. And now I'm accentuating things that are purely white, right? I'm turning them black. It's kind of weird. It's a little bit opposite of what I was doing before. So any features that were white, like these white stone walls over here, are going to show up really, really nicely now that I've thresholded this. And if I click OK, this is actually going to turn this image into a binary black and white image. And we can just make sure that we get rid of any residual color information we save it out. Uh, and by going to a grayscale, right? To a black and white kind of thing. We could have gone to a grayscale um, first and then done the threshold second. So I'm going to just undo these things that I did here. Um, one last thing in the color um, uh, area over here that, well, there's a couple of things that we could talk about. There, there are a few other things that we might want to do 
uh, just brightness and contrast. Increasing contrast, we've kind of done that in our curves, but we can do it with a different slider over here. And you can see essentially doing some of the same things we were doing in our curves and thresholds. Brightness levels too. Um, we can darken them up. Basically, that would be bringing the whole curve down a little bit. I'm going to cancel that here. Uh, posterize, we can actually reduce the bit depth. <laughs> we can change the levels, uh, sort of categorizing colors. In this case, let's say I want only like 14 colors out of our possible many millions. And, uh, you know, it'll show the color. The color is sort of mapped down to a, a fewer number of colors, in this case only four. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to hit cancel. Um, but the other really cool thing that um, we can do is desaturate. And this gives us a variety of ways of actually making a grayscale image. So the, the basic way I showed you earlier just sort of takes the average. Here we have lightness, luminosity, and the average of lightness and luminosity. So if we play around with this, we see we get a, a couple of different um, uh, outputs. And this is kind of a fun way to get a slightly nicer looking um, black and white image. For most photographs, these things don't make a huge amount of difference, but they accentuate different uh, color combinations. They're almost like putting filters on a black and white camera. So I encourage you to look at that. And let's see, is there anything else I want to talk about in the color menu over here? Oh, yeah, invert and value invert. Um, well, let's just show you what invert looks like. Uh, uh, it turns it into a negative in this particular case when we're looking at it as a color image. Um, if we were looking at it as a grayscale image, I'll just do the real quick grayscale transform like that. And we did an invert. It would look like, well, more like a black and white negative. Um, this is useful actually if you've done a threshold and you got black and white, uh, you know, uh, only black or only white, and you wanted to switch the two so that the white areas turn black. You could do that too. So if I un, uh, undo that, and I go back to my threshold, and I just do this threshold over here. But what I can do is go to the colors and just go to invert. And uh, here, it just flips, right? Just like in, like a negative. It turns the black areas white and the white areas black. Um, and then, let's see, under the colors, there's a few other things that you can work with over here. Most of those are, are what we would do, generally speaking, for general enhancements. Um, there's a few other ways to invert, you know, the values. This is kind of going to be kind of interesting when you see what it looks like here. It's not quite the same thing as making a negative. Um, it's just another way to manipulate, again, the colors and how they look. So that's what it looked like before, and then that's what it looks like after, right? So it's kind of just enhancing different uh, it's sort of changing the ordering of the colors, the sort of swapping the red for the blue and the green, you know, so moving that kind of stuff around. It's really kind of an interesting enhancement effect. Almost looks like a false color satellite image. So that's a cool thing to do. So let's uh, undo that. Okay. So that's basically what we have here in terms of the color manipulations. Uh, and then what we're going to do is some filters now um, over here. So I'm actually going to uh, just change this image back to grayscale because I think it's kind of more instructive to show you this in, the, in a grayscale image right here, what I'm going to do some of these things. Okay. Um, the first thing we're going to do is something called uh, low pass filtering or blur. In this case, we're going to go to the filter menu. We're going to just, it says blur. There's a variety of ones that we can, we can pick, but the one we're going to use is Gaussian blur. And this is a applying what we we'll call a convolution or convolving filter, a moving window across this and averaging everything inside the moving window. And here we have a five by five pixel neighborhood and we get a little preview of what it looked like. So if we uncheck this, that's what it looks like in the original image. And this is what's going to look like in the, um, uh, resulting image. And we can increase our neighborhood size and we can see essentially what we're doing is blurring the image more and more. So if we do this at a 16, well let's do it at a 15 by 15 neighborhood, it runs the filter across the image. You can imagine a, a 15 by 15 pixel window is moving across and it's basically calculating the average in that uh, window and assigning that value to each uh, particular image or each particular pixel um, with at the center of the window. So if I zoom in now, we can actually see we don't get that hard pixelation that we saw before. We get sort of smoother blobs. 
and this is actually quite useful to uh, get rid of detail. Sometimes detail is our enemy, and we don't want to see the sort of high frequency uh, detail. We want to see the smoother, uh, low frequency uh, detail, the shapes of the general landform features. So if I undo, we can see, and I redo. So if we zoom in on this particular area here, if I undo, we, we would might, or I might originally be drawn to these individual trees, these orchard trees. And if we want, if we did our low pass filter, we might now, oh, look at that. Now we're actually seeing some broader scale patterning. Uh, and depending on what level you do your, um, your Gaussian blur, your low pass filtering, um, let's just increase it to something really big. That's going to uh, change the scale of the, the patterning that becomes apparent. So this is sort of helpful to help you uh, get rid of a bunch of extraneous detail and focus on broader landscape hill pa scale patterning. So here at this level, we don't see any detail at all. All we see are these big splotches. And if I zoom out, uh, that's kind of useful to help orient ourselves and see, hey, these, what we're looking at here are the, the farm field patterns and the patterns of the valleys and the erosion. And we don't have to worry about all the detail of the trees and the roads and that kind of stuff. Um, the sort of opposite effect of uh, low pass filtering is high pass filtering. And it's the same idea, except what we're doing is trying to increase some of those uh, resolutions or, or sharpen up the details between neighboring pixels. And uh, we go down to um, uh, the, the, the enhance menu here. Um, that's where we can get to some of that things over here. And there's a variety of ways of doing sharpening. There is um, actually a fairly simple sharpening method here. Uh, and you can just do a slider for sharpness. You get a little preview over here. And uh, if you just hit this, let it run over here. Um, and you'll kind of see it just everything looks pops a little bit more. The local contrast is a little more. So if I zoom in and I hit Control Z and Control Y back and forth, you can kind of see what we've done. It's sort of like doing a little bit of a histogram stretch, but at the local level, at a sort of fine scale level here. So that's a fairly simple way of doing that kind of stuff, uh, sharpening. If we go down to Unsharp Mask, we have a little bit more control over this. This is a more complex uh, method in which we sort of blur and then unblur uh, and use that to mask out different things. And so basically, um, by moving these more sliders, we have more control over the degree to which sharpening is done and at which scale it's done over here. So if we do this, it's going to take actually quite a bit longer because it's a much more complex uh, routine. You have to run a Gaussian blur first and then uh, uh, at, a, at a couple different scales and then take a difference between them and use that to mask out areas to not sharpen. You see what I've done here is really kind of done uh, a, a kind of extreme sharpening, but it's really starting to enhance some of the local contrast that's like, for example, present in the farm fields between slightly more lush and slightly less lush areas, right? It's really starting to bring out some of these patternings. These things might actually be archaeological features, right, in the field. This might actually be an archaeological site. In fact, I absolutely know it is because I've been to this farm and I've had lunch and tea right here. And I know that they actually have a Roman site here and a bunch of Roman burials all around here. And in fact, that's what these features here are that we're looking here. And some of these things out here are also uh, features related to the Roman um, uh, occupation of this particular area. Um, so let me undo that here. And so that's cool. Those are the first two real interesting enhancements or, or at least uh, manipulations of the imagery to help orient our minds around different levels of detail, different levels of contrast. Uh, another uh, really useful thing to do uh, is edge detection. And this is really cool. So um, what I'll do is I'll just use the, the, the main method that I recommend, which is difference of Gaussian. There's Laplacian and a couple other pretty interesting edge detection methods. And you could play around with each one of these things to see the, how they're different. Um, this is kind of similar to sharpening uh, uh, in terms of what it's actually doing. And essentially what we're doing is blurring at two different levels and subtracting them with image math. So if I increase 
the radius of one, we can actually see our preview here. We're getting sort of wider edges. And what this is, is trying to look at local contrast. When does um, black rapidly shift to white? And anywhere where that happens, we're going to assume that that's the edge of a feature. So if you see right here, some of these roads over here, uh, some of these areas where white turns to black relatively rapidly, the edges of the fields, for example. And we just want to extract not the whole blob, but just the outline of this. This is really useful for sort of almost automatically drawing maps. Um, you can see this is taking a little bit of time on my little small laptop over here with its dinky Celeron processor inside of it. Uh, but when we see it done across the whole image, ah, now you're going to start to be really interested, right? So now we're actually looking like a, almost like a line drawing of this. And you actually see this particular, the particular feature, especially these buildings with their hard edges and the roads with their hard edges really start to pop out. And now we can chain this together with a couple other things. So maybe we want to enhance with uh, a little bit of sharpening, right? Just some basic sharpening along the edges uh, like this. Let's just sort of go up to like that, click OK. So this will run relatively quickly. Yeah, now the edges are really starting to pop like that. Ah, now you might be thinking, maybe I want to make this into almost like a line drawing. Remember that? threshold tool that we had before. Oh, maybe now we can actually move the threshold around to uh, enhance or sort of just pick out some of the edges but not all of them. So maybe we actually want to move this from both sides. Oh, well that's too far like that. And let's see if we move this further like that. There we go. Now we've got some things like that. So we click OK. And now we're really starting to be able to outline certain features. In this particular case, uh, really the edges of the buildings. And I sort of even lost some of the edges of the road with my threshold right there. And we've definitely got the edges of a lot of the, the, the um, trees and the fields. And uh, now we can actually continue manipulating these things. So now that we have a thresholded black and white image, we can actually do a couple of different interesting analyses that are still here under the generic tool, filters generic tool. We have dilate and erode. And this is sort of like growing or reducing the areas or shrinking the areas. Unfortunately, here in the menu, they've got the two things mixed up. So dilate is actually erode and um, erode is actually dilate. So dilate is the, to grow. So we're going to actually pick uh, erode and we'll see. We'll just, it'll make sense when you see what it does. It actually grows everything by a pixel. So that's technically that's a dilate. In unfortunately, in the menu there, it says erode. Um, and if I hit Control Z and Control Y back and forth, you see basically we grew by a pixel. We enhanced, or we we just took wherever it was black and we added one black pixel to either side of it, just to make the lines thicker. Okay. Uh, and by contrast, the actual erode um, uh, method again. They've messed up these two things in the menu here. So pressing dilate is actually going to erode. Um, does the opposite. Wherever you have black pixels, it'll subtract one from the edge. So shrinking, making the lines thinner. So you see like that. I'm filtering out a bunch of the, the really thin lines, and I'm, I, I'm getting just things that were thicker. So if I undo some of these things, and, uh, and I go back to this, go back to my um, uh, threshold uh, operation over here. And let's just say I put my threshold oops, somewhere pretty high up here so that I so that I have just basically th thick lines. There we go, something like that, right? This is where a, uh, a, a road um, operation is going to be really useful. So let's show you what this looks like. A bunch of thick lines and we want to shrink a lot of them and get rid of the sort of noise there. But sort of removing all the sort of thinner areas and just showing us sort of the, the, the broader scale patterning here. Really the outlines of these farm fields uh, like this. So uh, I think that's all we're going to do for now. That's actually quite a bit of stuff. Um, there's a, a, a bunch of more things in here that we can cover. Uh, but those are really the, the, the basic things. Um, uh, low pass filtering with our Gaussian blur, uh, sort of high pass 
uh, sharpening with our unsharp mask uh, or just basic sharpen over here. Um, edge detection with our difference of Gaussians or our Laplacian or our other methods. And then our uh, dilate and erode methods that we've done after we did our threshold to a binary black and white. We messed around with our levels and our curves to do contrast stretching. Uh, we messed around a little bit with some of these other tools in here, including inverting uh, values, which I can just show you again what it would do over here. Uh, fun things like that. Uh, and then our basic image mode, and we did some of our flips and rotates and transforms and scales and that kind of stuff. Uh, so those are the main tools that I use in GIMP to do basic qualitative uh, imagery analysis and they're the same exact operations that we would use in some other uh, more quantitative piece of software like ImageJ. The last thing I'm going to say here about is about saving your work. So uh, GIMP uh, has a native file format that is non-destructive. So if you just do file save, what it's going to do is save something called an XCF file. This is what sometimes is referred to as a sidecar file. It saves a little text file of all the operations that you did. And next time you open up GIMP, because this file can only be opened in GIMP, it will load it back up. It will not affect the original image that you loaded in and it will not make a new actual image file like a TIFF or a JPEG or something like that. Um, so I often save multiple XCF files for different operations. Uh, that way I can go back in here and I have my stack of undos. If I have layers and a bunch of other edits in, in here, I can get back to all of that stuff. Uh, and I don't overwrite my original image by doing this. If I want to save an actual graphics file, like a JPEG or a TIFF, I have to go down to File, Export, all right? And when I do this, it gives me the opportunity to save at any file format that I want to. And you can see the massive number of file formats that GIMP is able to read and write over here. PNG, JPEG, TIFF, GIF, you know, all the regular ones, plus a whole bunch of other things, including PDF files, you can read and write, um, uh, uh, animated GIFs, you can read and write, uh, PGMs. Uh, all kinds of other sort of more obscure um, files. It can also read Photoshop documents uh, and uh, documents that are also non-destructive from other uh, uh, image analysis and image manipulation uh, pieces of software. Um, so here I'm exporting a PNG file. Um, I would actually probably recommend in this particular case a JPEG file because I want to make it smaller. So I can hit export. It will ask me how much compression I want to apply. In this case, I'm going to do pretty harsh 85% just to get the file size down. And then I can go back and see. Here's my XCF. We can see it's got basically no data actually in it, 3.8 megabytes. Here's my original TIFF file here. And then over here is my exported JPEG of my uh, edge detect results over here. So if I open it up, I can open it up in any image viewer and that's what it looks like there. So anything that I do in GIMP, uh, I can save my uh, stack as a GIMP, uh, GIMP file so I can get back to it and keep editing it, but I can export anything at any point into a new image file uh, sort of um, that I can use as a, a, a graphic in my analysis. All right, that is it for now and we'll be back next week with more imagery analysis.